Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'd like now to introduce uh, Farnoosh Badnai Kashani. Uh, who will speak about on-the-fly visualization. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Sorry? Yeah, that's fine. Sorry for the call. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Farnoosh Panay Kashani. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Southern California. Today, I'm going to talk about on-the-fly visualization of scientific geospatial data sets using wavelengths. Uh, we have developed a system called Geoda up here. Stands for Geospatial Data Analysis. My co-authors are Cyrus Shahabi and Kai Song. Cyrus uh, directs InfoLab at USC, and Kai Song is a PhD student, and I'm presenting on his behalf. So, bear with me. This is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll motivate the problem and then define it as well. And then uh, I'll talk about Geoda in two steps. First, I talk about the underlying technology, which involves a brief description of what Weblet is, uh, in case you don't, you're not aware of it. And then talk about Wallab, the technology that we used uh, to do online visualization, on the fly visualization. And at the end, I'll show you what the system looks like, uh, some examples of it, and a summary of future work. So to give you a little bit of background on this, this is a, this is a work done under project, CERP project, Strategic University Relationship Pro Project with JPL, between USC and JPL. Uh, the scientists are from Climate, Oceans, and Solar Science section at uh, JPL at uh, Pasadena, California. And uh, these are our collaborators there. And we did the computing part of the project. So what is it about? This is about air science data visualization, but the tool is developed such that it's more general. Uh, at least this is why, how we uh, think about it. But what is, uh, let me just define what specifically they wanted to do and why do they call it on the fly visualization. Uh, so scientific data as we know it is a multidimensional data. You have multiple dimensions and multiple measures for scientific data sets. Particularly, let me have a running example here. I'll talk about SST, which is the sea surface temperature data. Uh, two, two dimensions, longitude and latitude, and one measure value, which is the actual temperature. And this is uh, a data set which is collected via satellite. Um, what is visualization as they define it? It is basically generating a color map of the color coded map of the sea surface temperature for the entire world. Um, and what that involves from the computing part is that for each pixel that you see here in this picture, uh, you have to, we have to uh, run an aggregate query. And this aggregate query could be any aggregate query in general, any polynomial aggregate query, particularly the aggregate query that I'm going to use as an example, running example is an average query. So think of this as you want to have, you want to see the big picture of average temperature uh, spatially distributed across the entire world. Uh, one specific uh, feature that they wanted this map to have is that it should be interactive. So people are supposed to be able to pick a particular range of data, any range uh, basically, and then zoom in. And they didn't want to get this. This is basically a direct cut of the same visualization. They wanted to get that. And that's basically rescaling the color-coded map based on the temperature values that you see there. And the reason for that is that they wanted to see how the data is distributed spatially within that particular range that they're interested in. So that I call rescaling. And this step I call uh, range selection. So to be more elaborate, let's say this is our original region. 
particular query, aggregate query, and we can, and a user can uh, select any range that he is interested in. This range is selected. While the range is selected, the uh, the visualization should be rescaled to show the actual values relative to the range selected. Uh, so they already had a version of this uh, running. They did have, a, but the version was offline meaning that the selected ranges were pre-calculated. So you had, they had identified particular ranges that they might be, user might be interested in and at different resolutions, and they have pre-calculated the values. Why did they do that? Because it just takes too much time to run these aggregate queries on large data sets. Uh, so they pre-calculated that, and then the user would pick a particular range. This is not by and drawing a particular range, it's just by picking a particular range and a particular resolution, and they would pop up the uh, pre-calculated visual, visualized map. So that's uh, uh, what I call pre-selected ranges. So that's what they had. And of course, the L every visualization was pre-calculated. What they wanted to have then is on the fly range selection and resolution selection. So they would uh, require the user should be able to basically pick any range with any resolution that he is interested in. And more importantly, they wanted to, this to be happen off on the fly, meaning that if the data is going to change, say for example, the data is received through data streams on the fly, they wanted to this to be happen on the fly, meaning that they don't they didn't want to pre-calculate every data that is coming in. It's just too much overhead for for scientists. Uh, so they uh, wanted the on the fly visualization in two sense on the fly range selection resolution. Also, this should happen on dynamic data, and that's and this is the specific problem that we had to start with. The system that we have developed is called Geoda. As I said, geospatial data analysis, we named it. Uh, we tried to make it as general as possible. In this presentation, I'll talk about it in the context of a particular scientific uh, earth science data. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about it in two steps. First, I'll define the underlying technology, which is the wavelet based approach. I'll give you a little back, a bit of background about wavelets, the technique itself, and then the system. So what is wavelet? Is I getting too far? So what is wavelet? Uh, assume this is a one-dimensional one data. Uh, it's a vector, uh, data vector, basically A. Uh, a wavelet transform of a data set basically generate maps the data to another data set with particular characteristics that I'm going to review right now. Let's talk about the actual mapping, and afterwards I'll talk about the characteristics that you get from this mapping. And that's the purpose of mapping, actually. So consider this data set. Uh, taking any, a wavelet transformation is basically a convolution of the original data set with a couple of filters. In this case, our filters are these two. And these are basically simplified versions of the actual filters from hard wavelet, if you're aware um, of that. So what happens is that for any pair of the uh, cells here, what I do is that I take them, I do a linear combination of those based on these weights. So this is basically half of 80, half of 70 uh, added together, divided, and this would be 75. This is an average. And this basically identifies the variance, how variant they are from the average, five. And if you keep doing that for every pair of objects, you get two more values, and so on and so forth. Eventually, you'll have the same data set, but transform the size of this it wouldn't change. Uh, now, let's for, for the uh, left um, sub-vector, we repeat the same process. So we take these two now, we generate 75 and 0. 75 is the average, and 0 is the deviation from the average, and so on and so forth, for, and as well for the 52 and 50, 51 and 1, and so on and so forth, uh, until eventually we get to uh, finish up with every vector. And we pick, 
a certain set of a subset of the numbers that we pick, and these basically represent the average, if you want to call it, depending on the filter that we have used. This represents the average of the data set, and these, the, the, these are basically capturing the details of the data set. And if you put them together again, you have the same size of data, but with some characteristics. What are those? So this is called the Bevelot transform or discrete Bevelot transform of A. And this can be, of course, generated by a matrix uh, multiplication. What's specific about it is that if you have a, if you don't want to keep every, uh, every uh, item of this state, map data set, if you already have limited space or you just want to retrieve the data gradually, progressively, you start from left, the most important representative of the data. If you retrieve that and put the rest of it as zero, this, is, this would be the, and go back with the mapping, what you would get as the original data set is this. And this is a fairly good representation or approximation of the original data up there. And if you keep doing that, you get closer and closer to the actual original data set that you've generated. And eventually, you can get the original data without any loss. Wavelot is a lossless uh, map, mapping function. So you get a multi-resolution retrieval of the data. And that's one of the features that we use. And the second one is compression. If you basically don't have enough space to keep everything, you can get rid of the unimportant uh, 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 items of the data. And in this case, it happens to be the ones with lower absolute values. So if you get rid of these, what you get is compression. With four items, you can represent the entire data set with fairly good approximation. And that's the second property, basically, a different variation of multi-resolution property. And these are the properties that we are going to use, particularly the first one, without technique. So, and this is the compression part, the property is what uh, usually uh, database people have used uh, while, uh, once they talk about wavelets. So Wavelet in general has been used in database community in two senses. One is in the sense of compression, and one is in sense of query compression, as I'm going to talk about. And this is what we do. Um, so the idea there is that they want to save space. Space is not that important anymore. We have terabytes of uh, disk space, uh, really inexpensive. And so the main idea there was that you wanted, they wanted to reduce the size of data so that the queries that run on top of the data run faster. And that was, again, the scale problem data scale problem. Uh, problems with those, uh, with this, those approaches, uh, some of them I've listed down there, are that uh, they, they will only give you the approximate values because they have dropped some of the coefficients of the data. And this is very data dependent. So, they, so you cannot contemplate the, what you get at the query time. You, can, you have to compress the data um, in advance, uh, regardless of the query. So depending on the query, you might miss keeping the right coefficient of the data. So that makes the query processing with these data sets, compressed data set, very data dependent. Uh, and also the error you get, basically that's in another way of saying that, the data that you get is basically the error rate is depending on the data. On the other hand, what we do is that we compress not only the data, but also the query. I'll talk about it later on. Uh, but what you can get with this uh, are particularly these two features. Not only we can do fast, uh, fast query processing, we get progressive results, which is basically exploiting the multi-resolution feature of the wavelet. And also, this is data independent. Why? Because at the query time, you already know uh, what is specific coefficient of the data that you're interested in. So you keep the data as it is. You don't do any compression. You have enough space. At the query time, just look at the query, figure out what is the coefficients of importance that you want to retrieve from the data set, and you pick those and uh, answer the query. That's an intuitive way of describing 
the technique that we had developed. But this is more uh, more detailed approach of descri describing this, and I'm going to describe it with an example. Uh, consider this as the original data, A. Uh, if you have a transform, uh, this is the same data set, but I'm using here now, I'm using the actual filter, hard filter, uh, so you get the different values here. But this is actually the Wavelet transform version of the original data. Uh, if you want to do, say, an aggregate query sum uh, on this data, so you want to calculate the sum of these values, and consider that this is a small example, you want to do it on terabytes of data, or gigabytes or terabytes of data. Um, so if you want to do it for the entire data set, one way to uh, formulate the query is that just define it by uh, another vector that for each cell that you want to include in the summation you include a 1 and elsewhere you have a 0. In this case since you want to have summation of the entire data you include 1 in every place. Uh, so to calculate the summation what you do is that if you use the Parseval theorem basically you transform this we call it the range query. This range is now the entire data set. You transform the range query to the, I'm losing this, okay. Anyway, we, uh, we transform the range query to the wavelet domain. So this is the wavelet co uh, co uh, wavelet, uh, corresponding wavelet transform version of the query itself. And we already have the wavelet transform version of the data. And if you do the dot product in the wavelet format, Wavelet domain, it's, it's uh, proof that the result that you get would be the same as doing the, the dot product in the uh, original domain. This was a simple range query. Now let's make it a little bit more difficult. You have an actual range here, specific set of uh, values that the scientist will pick to have a summation on those. The range query will be formulated as such as I defined it, and the sum expected summation is. 304 if you sum up these values. Uh, and if you go through the same process, transform the query to the wavelet domain, and do the dot production between the two uh, vectors, you'll get the same value. Right? So, and that's the process that we go through. But what's the benefit of this? And this goes back to uh, properties of wavelet. Uh, the main property that we are using here is that once you have a range query defined, uh, the uh, let me show you the main uh, main feature of this approach. The main feature is that if you want to do the query processing in the actual domain, uh, you have to do uh, the uh, summation in O n. So you have to cover the entire range to get that done. Uh, but if you go to the uh, wavelet domain, I claim that you can do it in log, log n time, and that's much faster. Um, and this stems from this particular property that once you have a large range in the original domain, the wavelet in the wavelet transform, you get a lot of zeros. And that's proven by theorem. Uh, you get a lot of zeros, so in the wavelet domain, you have to retrieve a uh, limited number of actual items of the data to be able to calculate the actual, the final result of the data. So, and that's the main feature. The larger this range or the more consistent the range is defined in the query, you get more of these zeros there. So instead of going and retrieving every data item to calculate the summation for the range, you, you do it for all log n of them and you, you are still able to calculate this exact result. And that's the main feature. But it steps, but you might think that, okay, if uh, that's fine. If I have the wavelet form of the uh, query available, this can happen in all log n time. But what happened to the transformation? That I'm receiving the query on the fly, and I have to transform it to the wavelet. And this may take O n. It turns out that it, it will take you O log n as well to transform the query. So once you get the query, you transform it in O log n to wavelet domain. And in O log n again, you do the uh, uh, dot product. 
and you find the exact result in all log n. And of course, you can, this is, based, this is not avoiding any compression. You can compress the data as well. So assuming that you don't want to keep every coefficient of the data in the weblet domain, you can just get rid of those. And the final result will be pretty much uh, accurate as well. So this doesn't exclude uh, compression. So we have compression. But you can add data uh, query compression. If you have data compression, you could use also query computation. This is a more elaborate version of the same discussion. Another example, you have a large range, many zeros here. And these are the two theorems that are proven uh, in our paper, in our publications. So one is that using lazy variable transform, we can, we can show that transforming a range query uh, with large ranges in the actual domain, two wavelet domain will take O log n. And uh, also, we have shown that there are O log n non zero values in the transformed version of the query in the wavelet domain. So the total complexity will turn out to be O log n. And that's basically the enabling feature that we are going to exploit for on the fly uh, visualization. These are some related work. Uh, Sebastian was talking about data cubes. These are some examples of those. Uh, and this is how Volapp is compared, uh, performs in querying and, of course, update of the data. The, the, the data might change. So you if you do pre-calculations, you have to be careful how long it takes to update the data as well. So you have to do well in both cases. The initial approaches we're basically focusing on improving the query time. But to have both, uh, SDDC was proposed. And if you, see, if you look at this, you'll see that the whole app matches that, but provides some more features, including progressive data access and data independence. Uh, so that was the technology that we are using, basically. And to summarize how we are using it, Basically, when you want to visualize a, data, uh, a large data set, these aggregate queries are, are run in log n now uh, on the fly on large data set. And it turns out for large data set, log n is not large. So you can visualize the query on the fly. The system that we have developed, Geoda, this is the architecture of the system. So we, once we receive the data, the data, specifically the data that we received from our air science scientists uh, were in NC format. We had to convert them to text and then uh, uh, do wavelet transform on those to generate wavelet data cubes. So these are, again, you can think of it as a pre-calculation of the data. And once we have the data in a wavelet format, and this, in this case, we didn't compress the data. We had the entire data set there. Uh, we implemented the technique that I just went through wall app as one module and on top of it we, we had a plotting tool that basically taking the query it basically um, redefines it as a set of aggregate queries send it to wall app and this wall app is basically running on top of wavelet data cubes that you have generated eventually the color code map is generated and at the presentation here, we just uh, over, uh, we just uh, load the data on the Google map. We use that as a presentation here, and it could be could go anywhere basically as a mashup, and we present it there. So it's a web-based system at this time. But depending on what type of presentation you can use, you can have it anywhere that you're interested in. Uh, the particular data set that we looked at, since the pro proposal was defined as the Hurricane, hurricane Watch uh, application, uh, we were looking at Helena uh, data set, which is one of the hurricanes that happened years ago. Uh, this data set had uh, 10 plus dimensions, many of them, uh, particularly with the uh, tool that we, we pro with the prototype that we uh, developed. We use two of the dimensions, uh, longitude and latitude, and many variables, many of them, I don't uh, know what they mean, but we use particularly SSD. Uh, the resolution of data, one kilometer by one kilometer worldwide. It, this was a daily sample data set. Uh, and of course, 
there's a lot of land which uh, the sample data will turn out as null. And we generated the Helena data cubes uh, accordingly. This is, the, this is how the presentation tier looks like. This is a web-based system, as I said. Uh, we have developed it uh, based on, this is a cross-language development. Uh, on the server side, we use C Sharp and ASP.NET, JavaScript, some on the client side. We had to use Ajax to be able to update the scale when we are doing rescaling. Uh, and it includes some multi thread programming as well. Uh, the visualization was, uh, is happening in, uh, in a progressive fashion, meaning that what we do, again, we exploit the multi-resolution property of the wavelet as I described it. Uh, so the query is for, uh, once formulated by the user, the query is sent over to the server asking for the 10% a first 10% most important coefficients. Uh, and the result is retrieved, the map is generated, sent back to the client. And this happens over and over again, uh, happens over and over again, and eventually you'll get the exact value. And that's useful to scientists because they, wanna, they may want to stop the progression at any time and move on to another query as they're exploring the data. Uh, let me try to uh, give you a glimpse of the data if it's the uh, Joda. Okay, now this mouse is not. Okay, so I guess the resolution has changed. So this is the data set, the area covered in this particular uh, representation of the world, and the resolution, particular time, and you could basically scroll over time uh, and pick a particular di dimension in, uh, or measure attributes to work with. In this case, this particular prototype has a sea surface temperature, as I mentioned. Uh, let me try to formulate a query here. And it is as fast as you see. Um, of course, we are trying it with higher resolution uh, data sets and more dimensions. Uh, and you can basically pick any range. As I said, we they require flexible range. And let me try to show you the rescaling property as well, if I can. Okay, here, uh, as you see, obviously, as we go up, this is temperature data. As we go up uh, towards the North Pole, we get cooler temperatures. Let me just extend that range towards the North. And what you expect to see is that in the areas that were yellow before, and now they are turning out red, because as compared to this blue up there, they have to be rescaled. And this can continue, of course. And so on and so forth. Okay. Okay, to summarize, uh, what we have developed is the framework for on the fly visualization of large uh, scale scientific data set. As I said, uh, we consider this as a general framework. It doesn't have to be on air science data. And we have developed also, designed and developed a uh, um, technique, particular technique for on the fly visualization. That's called WOLAP. And we have developed a prototype to implement and see how it works with a particular data set. Uh, future work, important future work, 
uh, are twofold. One is that, as you have noticed, uh, I didn't talk much about uh, dynamic data, uh, but the, I claimed it. So the, pr the thing is that the wall app can actually support dynamic data sets. So the data can change, and since the query is performed on the fly, uh, wall app doesn't really care uh, whether the data is updated or not. But the problem is that as data come in, since we have pre-calculated the data, and transformed it to wavelet domain, we have to append in the data as it's come transform and append it in as it's coming in so that we can, uh, uh, we can uh, on top of it, we can run the queries on the fly. So that's one of the research topics that we are pursuing with this project at this time, basically supporting on the fly append to wavelet data queues. And the second one, uh, this is an optimization future work. Um, if you, if you think about it, you'll see that there's a lot of overlap between the coefficients that you're retrieving for each of these pixels that you've visualized. So you can reformulate the queries instead of having a batch of queries, independent queries, you can reformulate them as a group aggregate query and exploit the, this overlapping to minimize the amount of time that you need to spend on retrieving the coefficients. So that would be even faster response time with a uh, large, that comes handy with larger data sets. And with that, I close. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, please. Does your uh, lazy theorem uh, require that the data be a uniform grid? I'm thinking. I don't think so. Why? So, so if you're given a, a start time and an end time, mm -hmm. and you don't know how many points fall between those, it'll still work? Oh, uh, so the assumption there is that, I mean, the, the property that the well, uh, lazy value transform is using is, the, is exactly the same feature, that it basically avoids going, going through every cell. It's right. just look at the boundaries of the data, the ranges that we have defined in the data. So if you go from zero to one, you have one bound and you have a large range, it just doesn't look at the data, just have a compressed version of the same range somewhere, and then eventually look at the boundaries again, and so on and so forth. So instead of looking at every data item, you're just looking at the boundaries of the regions that you have in the data set. I might have to ask you offline, but, but so you're saying if, if there were 20 points between that range or 30 or 40, that's the... That doesn't, yeah, it doesn't care. Actually, the larger the range is, the less boundary points you have, so the faster the transformation will happen. Uh, hi, first of all, uh, congrats on the work. This is really cool work. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you, what your experiences were with other methods, uh, such as maybe principal component analysis, where you have multi-resolution compression smoothing, a lot of the same sort of uh, features. Yeah, have not looked at it. Uh, I, I, my assumption is that they, they re work really cool in the sense of ac accuracy, but uh, I do believe that uh, the, from the uh, perf efficiency per perspective, they might not do well because I don't know how c customizable they are to pre-calculation. Uh, and so we're basically focused on a particular literature that we pre-calculating the data because the data is so large that you don't want to do any sort of on-the-fly uh, analysis. You have to have some sort of pre-calculations. And in this case, in our work is we have the transform, but you have to do the pre-calculation in a way that it is updatable, first of all, and also uh, it allows on-the-fly on the retrieval of the pre-calculated value. And that's, uh, the second one is implemented here. The first one is an ongoing work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.